The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable about the necessity for them to pray always without becoming weary. He said, there was a judge in a certain town who neither feared God nor respected any human being. And a widow in that town used to come to him and say, render a just decision for me against my adversary. For a long time, the judge was unwilling, but eventually he thought, while it is true that I neither fear God nor respect any human being, because this widow keeps bothering me, I shall deliver a just decision for her, lest she finally come and strike me. The Lord said, pay attention to what the dishonest judge says. Will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night? Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The Gospel of the Lord. A young journalist who was advancing his career was assigned to the Jerusalem Bureau of his newspaper. He gets an apartment overlooking the Wailing Wall. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Wailing Wall, the Wailing Wall was the old east wall that used to surround the old Jerusalem temple. And people come there throughout the day, throughout the evening to pray but they also come to put their petitions, their, their needs that they have, and they put them on little papers in the clefts of the rock, and then someone will come behind them at some point and pull one out and pray for it. So there's always people praying, and the very conservative Jews, the Hasidic Jews, you'll find them rocking back and forth like that when they pray. So it's a very holy place. Well, after several weeks, he realizes that whenever he looks at the wall, he sees an old man, an old Jewish man, praying vigorously. The journalist wondered whether there was a pu publishable story here. So he goes to the wall, introduces himself, and says, you come here every day to the wall. What are you praying for? The old man replies, what am I praying for? Well, in the morning I pray for world peace. Then I pray for the brotherhood of man. I go home and I have a glass of green tea and I come back to the wall to pray for the eradication of illness and disease from the face of the earth. Well, this young journalist is taken by the old man's sincerity and persistence. You mean you've been coming to the wall to pray every day for these things? The old man nods, yes. Well, how long have you been coming to the wall to pray for these things? The old man becomes reflective and then replies, how long? Uh, maybe 30, 35 years. The amazed journalist finally asked, how does it feel to come and pray every day for over 30 years for these things? How does it feel? The old man replies, it feels like I'm talking to a wall. And that brings us to our gospel. We have another one of those jewels that is found only in St. Luke's gospel, here from chapter 18. And it's a very important parable about prayer, and Jesus, unlike any of the other parables that he gives, lets us know from verse one what his intent truly is. He says this parable is intended for those who need to pray without giving up hope with regard to their prayer. And then he goes on to tell the story. He says, once upon a time there was a dishonest, or some translations have a corrupt judge. Now, first of all, the office of judge. In the earliest days of the Old Testament period, and we find evidence, for instance, in the book of Genesis, chapter 23, verse 10, and the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22, verse 15. The judge at the time, the person who issued decisions, 
was the tribal leader or the head of the clan. But by the time Jesus comes on the scene, there's actually an organized system of judges who would try cases. These people were of the Pharisee party. They were scribes, very learned in the law. And they would simply take the law found in the first five books of the Old Testament and apply it to secular affairs. It was a theocracy back then, if you will. But this man is called by Jesus dishonest or corrupt. Why? Well, the Lord tells us. He fears neither God nor has any concern about anyone other than himself. Now please remember, the word fear is used in the Bible in two senses. One is in scared to death, but more often the Hebrew root means to have a sense of awe or reverence. This man has no reverence for God. It's all about himself, you see. So, we're told that a widow comes knocking on his door and wants him to render a decision in, his, in her favor. Now, the word widow, once again, is a very rich word. It evokes all sorts of things. But the key thing we must keep in mind with regard to widows, that in the society back then, there were no widow's benefits. If you lost your husband, first of all, you were looked upon as an outcast. Why? You must have sinned. You did something to anger God. That's why he took your husband away. And if you didn't commit the sin, then one of your ancestors committed a sin, and you're just paying the price for it. These women were looked upon as sinners, pure and simple. But because they lost their sole means of support, they were often left to begging. They were considered some of the poorest of society. All you have to do is read the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, and especially Isaiah the prophet, chapter 1, verse 17. God had a special place in his heart for the widow, and he would punish the kings who ignored them. Well, this widow has some sort of injustice that's been done to her. Luke does not tell us what it is. It's not germane to the story, but she comes to this judge day after day to get an opinion in her favor. The judge, looking at her, wants nothing to do with her. She's a widow after all, a fourth class citizen. Why waste my time with this little thing? You know, who cares? I've got important people to see, big people for whom I need to legislate. Well, the widow won't give up. She keeps coming back. And finally, the judge perceives her to be a nuisance. She's bothering me, he says. But then finally, he gets scared. He gets afraid. He says, if I don't render a decision in her favor, she will strike me. That's what this translation says. The literal Greek, the word hypopiese, is a very rich word that comes from the realm of boxing in, Greek, in, in ancient Greece. And what it means literally is, she's going to hit me under the eye and uppercut and black my eye. He's scared to death, she's going to punch his lights out, basically, is what that boils down to. So he decides to render a decision in her favor. And look what Jesus says, the unthinkable. Pay attention, he says to this judge. Pay attention to him. Jesus is telling us to pay attention to a corrupt judge not because he's a corrupt person, but because he acted on behalf of this widow. And so Jesus uses this example as a way of teaching us about our faith and prayer. He says, learn a lesson from this judge. As this wicked judge, this unjust judge, would eventually give in to the persistent knocking on the door of this helpless widow, how much more will your good God, the just judge, move quickly on behalf of his children in need? Or in other words, God is going to be kind to us, not like this judge. But then he asked the piercing question. When the Son of Man comes at the end of time, will he find any faith on the earth? What's this passage mean for us? 
When Luke wrote his gospel, we're looking at somewhere between 80 and 85 AD. We're moving towards the end of the first century. And something very important is happening in Luke's community. People who had been taught that the Lord was going to come soon at the end of time have now waited 50 plus years since his death and resurrection. Where is he, they're beginning to ask. Is he coming at all? Was this just some story that the preachers made up? And so some of them are growing lax in their faith. Some are even giving up on their faith. They think they made the wrong decision getting baptized into Jesus Christ. And so Luke wants to let them know, you got to be persistent. You got to hang in there in the faith so that when the Lord comes at the end of time, he will find people who are faith-filled. But the key point of the passage has to do with the approach to prayer. And therein lies a problem for a lot of disciples of the Lord today. Two issues that we have with prayer. Number one, and I talked to a priest friend earlier this week, and he said he's going to be talking this weekend about 911 Christians. 911 Christians. And what's that mean? Well, I have a desperate need, and all of a sudden, I start praying. I have some kind of tragedy in my life, and all of a sudden, I start praying. The road to God becomes like one of those red things that we have in the walls of our school, press in case of emergency, and the, uh, the 911 services go into effect. What do I mean by that? Often, the only time we talk to God is when we need something when we need something. And yes, it's perfectly fine to talk to God anytime when you need something. But is that it? And the people who do, who have some sort of crisis that comes in their life, they'll come to me with frustration or hurt and they'll say, you know, I tried to talk to God. I don't know what to say. What do I say? And my response is, what do you need? Tell him. Well, but he's not saying anything to me. I don't appear to be getting any response from him. And the problem's not with God. The problem is with us. And I've been using an example this weekend of my playing of the saxophone. A number of years ago, I made money. I made a living playing the saxophone in nightclubs and other places. And, and so when I went to the seminary, I gave my saxophone away. After all, why would a Catholic priest ever need a saxophone? Well, one day when I was stationed up in Wheeling, a parishioner who was uh, owner of a music store called me up. He had heard me say something about the saxophone. And he called me up to say, Father, I've got a deal for you. He said, this company is clearing out their line of professional saxophones, and he said, I can sell you a professional saxophone for a song. Now, just so you know, playing a professional saxophone is like comparing a Cadillac to a Ford Pinto. Those things are wonderful instruments. And so he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He was Italian. And so I bought this saxophone. I got it home. I opened it up. I marveled at how it fingered, I put it back in the case, and I got busy and forgot about it. I ended up bringing here to Fatima a brand new, unused professional saxophone. Well, then I hired Christy Finney, our parish school music teacher, and she came up with the grand idea of getting a band started at the parish school. And it's become a wonderful thing, but in the beginning process, she said, you play instruments, why not play the saxophone for the kids? And I thought, well, sure, no problem at all. Well, I finally opened up the case, blew out the cobwebs, and started playing the saxophone. I knew the fingerings, I remember the fingerings, but guess what? I sound like a plucked goose the first time I tried. My armature was all out of whack. I hadn't played in years, for goodness sake, no wonder why. And then add the effect of arthritis in the fingers. Now all of a sudden, I was lamenting the fact of what I used to do, all these complicated jazz runs. Now I'm doing good to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. My point is this, should I have expected any different? 
I didn't open up my saxophone for years. Should I expect it any different? You know, we have a number of people here in our Perry's family that play golf. In fact, the ushers at the 530 Mass last night, they're all golfers, avid golfers. And I use the example of golfing. Can you imagine if you're an avid golfer and then all of a sudden you take a break for five years? Go back and take your first swing after five years. I guarantee you the next morning you're going to be hurting in places you never thought you could hurt before. Why? You're out of shape. So it is with prayer. If you find yourself confused, you don't know what to say to God, you don't know if God's even listening to you, remember, if you haven't practiced it, no wonder you're fumbling with it. You have to keep at it. But secondly, the goal of prayer. We really miss this one all the time. We think for some reason that the goal of prayer is to change God, and it's not. God is changeless. We can't change God. How can I think me, the peon that I am, could change the Almighty God? No. Prayer is not about changing God. It's about changing me. And I had an interesting example of that come in here just a few days ago. A woman in the parish who is dealing with three different terminal diseases. She has three different diseases, all of them, each of them are terminal. She is at the point now that she desperately needs a liver transplant. She's on a list at Cleveland Clinic. If she doesn't get her liver, she's going to die. And so she came in and to talk about her prayer life. And she told me, you know, when, when this first happened, when I was first told that I had to have a transplant, that I was going to die, she said, I got very angry with God, very angry. And I told him so. And I said, good for you. Tell God that you're angry with him. And she said, the more I prayed my anger to God, the more I felt God speaking to me and my heart changing, she said. She said, now I'm dealing with feeling arrogant. I feel very arrogant, you said. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I feel supremely arrogant because in order for me to get my liver, somebody has to die. And she said, I feel terrible about that. But I want to live, Father Jim. Is that wrong? And I said, no. No, it's not at all. And so my advice to her was to shift her focus. If her concern is feeling arrogant and selfish for praying for this, then start praying for somebody else. And I gave her two things for which to pray. I said, number one, pray for the person who is going to die so that you can get your liver. Pray for that person that they die a quick and as painless as possible death. However that might happen, pray for that. But secondly, I said, pray for the family of the victim. Why? Because they're going to be faced with a very difficult decision, and that is whether to donate the organs or not. And I told her, and this is true, all through the years, I've been called out many times to the hospital, to emergency rooms, when someone was brought in, especially a young person who was killed accidentally. The family is confronted about organ donation. They had never thought about it before because after all, this person is a teenager for goodness sake. You don't, that's something you normally think about when you're older. And now they have to make that decision. And if there's anything that helps that family heal, anything, it's knowing that their son's liver, their son's heart, is keeping some unnamed person alive clear across the other side of the country. I remember one mother in particular whose son died the result of an accidental death. He died on a dare, believe it or not. It was a horrible thing, and this woman just fell apart. But finally at the funeral home, when she was standing there at the coffin, and I went up to greet her before the other people showed up, she was fine. She told me, she said, five people, five people that I will never know have had their life extended because of my boy. So I told her, I said, pray, 
pray that the family can find peace, that God will use you as an instrument of bringing peace to these grieving parents and family. And she will. You see, my brothers and sisters, prayer is not about changing God, it's about changing me. And in my desperate prayer, in my prayer where I am persistent and I keep praying to God over and over again, I need to take the time to listen to what he is saying to my heart. And here's a couple possibilities. I may be hearing God say to me, listen to yourself. Listen to the word you're using over and over again. The word I, 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 I. Is that the only person in the universe? Is that the only person you can think of in the midst of your need? Or he may be saying to me, Jim, you're old enough to know the difference between your wants and your needs. Son, I will give you what you need. I always have and I always will. But I may not give you what you want and you need to learn the difference. And that knowledge can only come when I keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking like this widow. So my brothers and sisters, yes, as the Lord said, learn the lesson, learn the lesson. Prayer is not about changing God, it's about changing me. And as St. Augustine said a long time ago, even when God seems to be so far away, even when he doesn't seem to be listening, as Augustine said back in the fifth century, he is closer to me than I am to myself. And you can't get much closer than that. God is listening. Let us pray that we will do our part to be persistent. If we feel silly, if we feel hopeless, if it seems useless, Keep on going, keep on knocking, because the Lord will, as he promised, give us what we truly need.